Good morning, Nia. We start in about five minutes. Good morning. Uh, any idea what time you're going to be home? I'm taking six. I'm going to try to hold dinner. No. I'll sure. just eat when I get home just in case I'm late. Okay. Yeah, you guys do you and then I'll just catch up when I get home. Okay, I'm going out to the car. I'm going to get started. Oh, you're coming? Morning, Laura. Good morning. Wow, looks like you two might be the only ones today. Yeah, we'll see. Play nice, kitties. Play nice.
All right. It's 8 o'clock. I say we go ahead and get started. Maybe we'll get some more that'll join us in a few minutes. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to week three. A uh, little bit of business to take care of, as always, before we get started. Uh, oh, there we are. There you go, James. Good morning. Um, all right. So a little bit of business. Last week, we covered the first two colonies. We'll pick up that story. and We're going to try to cover the rest of the 13 colonies today, uh, at least the way they were founded. Uh, I'm hoping we can get that done today. We'll see. I'm running a little bit behind, but whatever. OK, we'll get it figured out. You did have your first home or your first real homework assignment due on Friday, and that was the explaining the Constitution. Um, out of the 11 students we have in this class, only five people turned that in. Five out of 11. That's less than 50% if I'm doing my math right. Make sure you get your work done. Okay, that's how you pass this class. That's how you pass all college classes. So if you haven't gotten that in, you still have until this Friday to get that one submitted. Uh, and, and I only knock off 10% as a late penalty, but at 90% is a lot better than zero. So please get your late work in if you haven't done that already. Uh, make yourself a note, circle it real big, put some asterisks by it and get it done. It's a challenging assignment, but you really can't do more, Frida. You really can't do this week's assignment very well until you've done last week's assignment. So I want to talk about this week's assignment. Because what you did last week with explaining the Constitution, you're breaking that document down and figuring out what it really says and what its purpose is. So this week, what you're doing is you're applying that understanding of the Constitution to a world of your own make making, a fictional world. So if you were creating a whole new country, oh, there's Riley. Good morning, everybody. Uh, let me make sure I got Riley in there. Yeah, one, two, three. Okay, good. Um, so you're taking the concepts of the Constitution, how it works, what its basic ideas are, and you're applying that to a, a fictional country, whatever you want it to be, Fordlandia or dystopia, whatever you want to call it. I don't care. Uh, call it Murphy Land. I, I don't care, okay? Now, you cannot just steal straight from the Constitution and copy that. That's not the purpose. Maybe borrow what works and improve upon that, because uh, there are certainly improvements that need to be made to the Constitution. Um, we've amended it, what, 28 times in our history and probably could stand to amend it a couple of more times. But that's a that's a conversation for another day. That assignment, the this writing your own Constitution, this is due this Friday by noon. So see, if you fall behind in one homework, it kind of cascades and it's easy to keep getting further and further behind the eight ball. Just get the work done, get it in, get it submitted, I'll grade it, I get it back to you really quickly, okay? Morning, Kay. Uh, da -da -da -da. There's Kay, okay, I think I got everybody. Okay, so any questions on either of the homeworks, anything about that, anything, any questions before we get going here? All right, I'm going to take your silence as collusion and we're just going to move forward. OK, so last time we finished by looking at the first two major colonies. The first is the Virginia Bay Colony or what we usually call Jamestown. OK, uh, and then the second is Massachusetts Bay or usually what we call Boston. Now, there's some real significant differences between these two colonies. But you need to remember that both of these are charters. That means that these they're both companies. They're owned by investors back in England. And the most important investor is going to be the king or queen of England. Whoever is sitting on that crown owns the majority of the stock in these companies. So it's like they're the CEO of the company. There's uh, good morning, Avery. Uh, all right. So we need to continue on and look at the next couple of colonies. And one thing I want to mention before we move beyond the Massachusetts Bay, um, in Virginia, they set up their own legislature. This was the Virginia House of Burgess. This is the first legislative body in the New World. In the, in the Massachusetts Bay Colony, they set up something very similar and they called it the general court. Morning, Michael. Okay. 
both of them, they, they were just their advisory bodies. They're there to kind of help the royal governor who's been appointed by the king or queen and help them, you know, give them advice. How do you think we should run the colony? That kind of thing. But they're not independent. <sighs> we often talk about the ideas of religious freedom and religious toleration. But I want to show, and we associate that with early America. That's one of the reasons that we often argue people came here was to practice this religious freedom. But I want to show you immediately the limitations on those. Okay. And that comes through one of my first heroes of early American history. And that's this guy, Roger Williams. Well, there we go. Roger Williams. Um, if you've ever been in a church, you probably sung some of his hymns. He wrote hundreds of them. OK, nearer my God to thee. The list goes on and on. I, I, I remember uh, when I was a kid, I went to a religious school and I actually played him in a play. Um, Roger Williams was a fascinating figure. He was trained in England as a preacher. And part of the problem that they're already having in the colonies is there's not enough preachers for all the people that are coming over. This is especially true in Boston. And so in Boston, to solve this problem, they establish a college. We call it Harvard. That's what they called it, too. But the only reason for this school is to train preachers in the Americas. It is not the elite institution that we think of it today. The only thing it taught was theology, how to become a good preacher. Uh, but they didn't have enough of them coming out of Harvard yet. This is still too early. It just been founded. So they're asking for more preachers to come over from England. Roger Williams volunteers for this, and he starts servicing the Native American population, trying to convert them to Christianity. Um, and while he's he's ministering to them, he's disturbed by the way they're being treated by the white colonists. And he hates the Europeans that the English are coming over and stealing Native American land. That violates the charter that they're operating under. And it's not a good idea. It's just a bad idea uh, because it spoils relations between Native Americans and Europeans. So. Uh, Roger Williams goes to the general court and he pleads, he begs, he says, we have to stop this. We have to stop our own colonists from stealing Native American land. See, there were people that said that. But the problem was this, this defied the power of the general court. And for that, Roger Williams was thrown out of Massachusetts. He was exiled. He's the first person that we know in the English colonies to be exiled and thrown out of the colony. Now, this is this is a death sentence. OK, um, raise your hand if you think you could be thrown out of the city into the middle of the wilderness and survive on your own. Not a whole lot of people. Interesting. Hmm. What are you going to do when the lights go off? Hmm. Now, anyway, that's a that's a nice apocalyptic story for another day. Well, this was supposed to be a death sentence. Instead, Roger Williams did the exact opposite of that. Instead, he established a town and an entirely new colony. He establishes the town of Providence and creates our third colony in the New World, and that is Rhode Island. It is also the smallest of the colonies, and it is also the only one of the original 13 colonies that practices, that practices true religious freedom and religious toleration. So we often talk about the New World as a place of religious freedom and toleration, but that's only really true here in Rhode Island. This is going to become one of the great centers for religious dissent. Uh, men or women who speak out against the religious authorities that just don't fit uh, in either Jamestown or in Massachusetts Bay or in any of the new colonies, this is a kind of place of, of rejects and, and rebels. And I kind of love that because we always need that place. And, and Rhode Island is beautiful. It's a really gorgeous place. The next of the colonies that will be established is Maryland. And we're going to talk in just a little bit about what's going, going on over in England. There's, there's some kind of religious chaos going on over there. We'll get there in just a second. Maryland was created. It's named after Queen Mary, who was the first of Henry VIII's children to take over after he died. OK, Henry VIII, everybody's heard about him, six wives of Henry VIII and all that stuff. Um, 
once he dies, he has no male heirs, so it's Mary, Queen of Scots, or better known as Bloody Mary, who takes over. She's Catholic, um, but her father had been Anglican. In fact, he starts the Anglican Church. So this starts that kind of flip-flop that's going on in England. Are you Catholic? Are you Protestant? Are you Catholic? And it keeps flipping back and forth. And whoever's in power is persecuting the other side. So Mary actually establishes a colony in the New World to protect Catholics. So the only religious religion you could practice in, in Maryland at first was Catholicism. That's written into their constitution. Um, problem is, very quickly, Protestants are going to take over control of Maryland and begin persecuting the Catholics. So there's that, right? It gets crazy another day for that story. So there's our first four colonies. Now, there's one colony that's actually in between all of these colonies. It's kind of wedged in there in between the northern colonies and the middle Atlantic. So you've got, let me see if I can grab my map here again. There we go. So you got Virginia right about here, but then you've got uh, uh, Maryland, which is just to the north of that. And then you've got uh, Boston or Massachusetts Bay and Rhode Island up here. So right in between is a Dutch colony that they call New Amsterdam. Now, today we call this New York City, but for almost 80 years, this was a Dutch property. And I want you to notice something. See that right there? We talked about this before. That is Wall Street. That's quite literally where they built their wall and they threw all their garbage on the other side. This separated the Dutch colony from the rest of the, the island that we now call Long Island, not Long Island, that's, that's Manhattan. I'm sorry, Manhattan Island. Um, and this is gonna be a thriving port. And the Dutch were really smart about this. They tried to make positive trading relationships with Native Americans, much like the French did. There weren't a lot of them in the New World, but they did establish a lot of very important, and I guess you could say, they created what, what we technically call a feudal aristocracy. And that's a, a really fancy word for, there's only a few really rich, powerful people in charge. Okay, and this should sound really familiar because that's kind of how most of America is today. Uh, certainly New York City, there's what's called the Register of Families in New York City, and it's the top 100 usually richest and most powerful families. Many of them are still descendants of the Dutch ancestors that helped settle the island uh, what, in the 1600s, in the 17th century. Okay, so now, now that's four English colonies and one Dutch colony. And that gets us up to the famous date of 1622. I don't give you a lot of dates, but this is a big one. This is when it all falls apart in England. So you've got this flipping and flopping back and forth, okay? You're Protestant, you're Catholic, you're back to Protestant. And each time when one group gets in charge, they persecute the other group. And then when this group gets in charge, they persecute the other ones. It kind of sounds like the Republicans and the Democrats, right? It's not really that different. It's just based on religion in this case. Well, England, it gets tired of that. And the guy who's really infuriating everybody, the king, is the same guy who is responsible for the version of the Bible that most people read these days, and that's the King James Bible. This is James the first. James the first is an awful king, okay? His people despise him, they hate the guy, and when he dies, there is a civil war, an uprising led by this guy. That, my friends, is Oliver Cromwell, probably one of the uglier dictators in, his, in the history of the world. But what Cromwell did, he was actually a member of parliament and he raised an army, a parliamentary army, to go against the king's army. And he ends up winning. And, and here's actually, this is my favorite story about this. Um, if you've ever 
rocked the Bieber haircut, you know, where it's just like one big circular thing and you just go like this to try to keep it out of your eyes. That's actually the haircut that comes from Oliver Cromwell. This is how you could tell you were a member of the parliamentary army called a round head because they literally put a bowl on your head and cut your hair around it as if I had any hair to cut still. Um, and and it, you became known as a round head and that's how they identified you on the field of battle. Oliver Cromwell and the Roundheads carry out a civil war, an insurrection, and they overthrow and take over the country for the next 40 years. For 40 years, Oliver Cromwell rules this country with an iron fist, and England is entirely distracted from what's going on in the colonies. They have almost literally nothing to do with what's going on in Jamestown or Massachusetts Bay or Rhode Island or Maryland. They're too busy just trying to survive. So this starts one of the most important traditions in American history, and that is the tradition of self-governance. These colonies have to learn how to govern themselves. And this is, I, I often say that the colonies are like children of divorce. Sometimes the parents are just too busy fighting to really take care of their kids. At other times, then, they try to make up for it by super parenting their children and try to stay right on top of them and, and like uber parent. And then they get fighting again and they're distracted again. And this whole time, the child has to learn how to govern themselves. And then when mommy and daddy come up, come back and they want to kind of govern the life again, well, then of course that child is going to resist. That's exactly what happens to the colonies. For 40 years, for two generations, the colonies are running themselves. They don't need England. They're, they're not getting anything from England. So they have to become self-sufficient. This is when the Virginia House of Burgess and the, the, the general court, they're really running the show in the colonies. But then after 40 years, after the English Civil War is over, the date is 1660. And this brings about what is called the Restoration. They, the English restore the English crown. They put it on the head of a guy named Charles II. You probably don't really need to know that, but I'll just give it to you anyway. Charles II becomes the King of England, but he has to make some promises. He has to promise to share his power with Parliament. And he has to promise that he will respect certain rights that the English people have. And so he signs a document called the Bill of Rights. Guys, this is where we will get our Bill of Rights from 100 years after this, okay? But this is really what is supposed to make England the kind of power sharing government that we're going to try to copy over uh, when our revolution comes. But after 1660, once again, England tries to reassert its authority over the colonies. Now, just picture this, OK? You move out of your parents' house. You've been independent for decades. And then something goes wrong and either your parents move back in with you or you have to move back in with them. Can you ever really go back to that old relationship when you were a teenager? Is it ever really going to be the same? Of course not. You've grown, you've matured. What if now suddenly you're 30 years old and your mom says, I want you home and in bed by 10 o'clock? Nah, it's just not going to work. That's part of the problem here is that when England tries to reassert their authority over the colonies, the colonies are going to resist. And while we're still 100 way, years away from the American Revolution, I, kinda, I hope we can get pretty close to that today, um, these tensions are going to start really starting to bubble starting in 1660. So this idea that, you know, some some fat white guys threw some tea overboard and that caused a revolution, just, just it's just not it's not historically accurate. It's a hundred years of complaints, of bad management, of absentee parenting from the, the, the colonies that is eventually going to build up and bubble over into the American Revolution in the 1770s. Okay, so 
the the by 1660 the english crown has been restored charles ii is grateful he's humbled he has to you know share power with parliament who doesn't who likes that but he's also grateful for those who helped restore him to power including probably one of the most important men of early american history and that is william penn william penn had helped Charles, he helped him in the negotiations to get him back on the throne. And once all of that is settled, then William Penn, uh, Charles asks William Penn what he wants for a reward. And William Penn says, I want a huge chunk of land in the new world. Okay, all you gotta do is look at the map of, a th of the first 13 colonies and you see Virginia's kind of big. They hadn't explored a lot of it. Um, you get to Massachusetts, a lot smaller, Rhode Island, even smaller, and then Pennsylvania is freaking huge, okay? It's a massive colony. And that's exactly what William Penn gets. He gets this reward of a huge chunk of land. And he's going to establish the first, well, really the second major port in the New World, Philadelphia is the first, excuse me, Boston was the first major port, but soon Philadelphia is going to take over. The city of brotherly love. Now, I've been there, it's an amazing city. Their public art program is second to, to none. And I gotta tell you, what most people, the only thing they know Philadelphia for uh, is from the Rocky Steps, where you run up and it's the Philadelphia Museum of Art that he's running up there. And there's actually a statue that everybody gets their picture taken up of Rocky. He's actually, ironically, the statue is at the bottom of the stairs, which I thought was kind of weird. But I highly recommend that you go to Philadelphia. It's filled with American history. And the Philadelphia Museum of Art is probably second only to the Louvre or, or maybe the Smithsonian Museums in D.C. It's an absolutely incredible collection. I highly recommend that you go and check it out. Um, William Penn made sure that his colony was a place of toleration. He wanted to make sure that women were equal to men. I know, crazy, right? But that was the exception to the rule. Everywhere else, women were generally seen as inferior to men uh, for a lot of different reasons, some of them being religious, some of them being cultural. We'll dig into that a little bit more later. Um, William Penn wanted to make sure also that they maintained positive relationships with Native Americans. So if white settlers began to move into their land, he made sure that they were compensated, they, that, they, that they were at least paid for the land that was taken from them. He figured that was the least that they could do. So during his lifetime, William Penn kept really positive relations with Native Americans. But upon his death, things changed quite a bit. When William Penn's sons inherited control of the colony, they wanted to establish another colony. And so they went to a local tribe. These were the Delaware Indians. And he made a deal with them, the, the two sons of William Penn, I can't remember what their names are, but they made what was called the infamous walking purchase. And this is how Delaware was established. They made a deal that they would buy for a certain amount of money that they had established ahead of time a colony that the length, excuse me, would be established by how far a man could walk in a single day from sun up to sundown. Okay? I mean, how, how far do you think you could walk in a single day from sun up to sundown? And if that was all, you know, that, that's how much land you would get. You'd be motivated to walk pretty quickly, wouldn't you? Well, okay, uh, uh, the sons of William Penn also got a little tricky. They sent out men the days before, and they used uh, they, they cleared paths. Instead of walking through forest and nettles and all that stuff that was there, they cleared paths, and they marked those paths very clearly. They also tricked the Native Americans in another way. Instead of just having one man walk this, they set out relay stations, so one man would like speed walk so far and then another one would take over and they would relay this. And in that single day, they were able to establish the length of what becomes the Delaware colony. This is now the fifth colony in the new world, fifth English colony in the new world. 
And this starts, well, Native Americans were furious at this. They, well, the, the chief of the tribe said, you run, but that's not fair. You were supposed to walk. By the time the runners had stopped, they had established more than 60 miles of land that they had covered, and that becomes the modern borders for Delaware. Uh, we're also going to see a new glut of colonies be established right after this as well. Uh, new York will be taken from the Dutch. New Jersey is established. Delaware, as I mentioned, and, Phil and Pennsylvania as well. Uh, the Dutch were driven out of New Netherlands in uh, 1664. So <clears throat> by this time, by the 1660s, 1670s, the colony population is doubling every 25 years. And that's an incredibly rapid rate of increase. And so you're seeing this very rapid rate of increase in the 1660s, 1670s, on into the 1680s. All right, I don't wanna cover every single one of the colonies, that's just kind of ridiculous. The last one I wanna talk about that's really unique is the colony of Georgia. Uh, I always get Ray Charles in my head every time I teach this. And I am going to say it like my friends from the South. So Georgia, I grew up in Florida. I'm allowed to make fun of them. If you've ever been to Georgia, you know there's good reasons to make fun of them. But anyway, uh, Georgia was established purposefully as a military colony. It was there. So let's let's go to our map here. So here you've got the English colonies that are spread along the, the eastern seaboard. And there's what will become Georgia. Notice down here in what's now Florida, all of this area was controlled by the Spanish. It was technically owned by the Spanish, but it's really being controlled by Native Americans. So these Native Americans, with encouragement from the Spanish, were constantly raiding into the colonies like South Carolina. North Carolina. And so to prevent that, to stop that from happening, the British established the colony of Georgia. And they do that in 1732. So I'm clearly kind of jumping ahead here. That's when Georgia will be established. And purposefully, this is just what, 60 years before, oh, not even 40 years before the American Revolution. Um, <clears throat> again, this is established as a military company, uh, uh, colony, excuse me. Oops. And the guy who sent and who is in charge of this is General James Oglethorpe. I love that guy's name. It just kind of fills your mouth when you say it. Uh, if you go to Georgia, his name is everywhere, okay? There is Oglethorpe this and Oglethorpe that. Like, if you've ever been to Georgia, you've seen this. It's just everywhere, the statues and all that stuff. Um, here's the funny thing, what I kind of love here. And, and the British by the 18th century had a bad habit of doing this. Um, the British loved their laws, and they loved to throw people in jail. Uh, by the 1730s, there were more than 60 crimes in England for which somebody could be executed. Uh, you could be executed for stealing as little as $2 worth of materials. Now, $2 then was a lot more than $2 now, but that's still, that's maybe, what, $40, $50 worth of stuff. Should you be executing people for $40 worth of stuff? Probably not. But you can see in our own constitution, when that's created, you get a jury trial for anything over $20 worth at that time. So uh, they wanted to be more tolerant than England was. So what this means is that England's jails are just filling with people. Their jails and their insane asylums. So they're getting too many people in the jails and the insane asylums. So they solved that problem right here. You might have heard about this happening in Australia, where England just like dumped all of their prisoners and their uh, their insane in in Australia, and we're like, good luck. That's exactly what they did in Georgia, and they did it in Georgia first in 1732. Here comes James Oglethorpe with shiploads filled of prisoners and the insane, and they live under martial law. He is the law, and they are chained. They are put in chain gangs. They are forced to build cities and colonies. Uh, they end up establishing my, one of my favorite cities of the South, and that's Savannah. Uh, if you haven't been to Savannah, you really haven't seen Georgia at its finest. 
a beautiful city, absolutely gorgeous. And right now is the best time to go visit during the cold weather. Uh, Savannah is a, a beautiful city. I highly recommend it. But, you know, honestly, if you've ever been to Georgia, you notice there's a whole lot of kind of crazy going on there. Well, again, it was well established by criminals and by the criminally insane, at least as far as England was concerned. Now, the most interesting part, I think, about the founding of Georgia is in its charter, slavery was specifically prohibited. You could not own a slave. You could not be a slave. Although these people were kind of forced to act like slaves of the state, but that's a that's a different story, right? Okay. So they purposely write this in. You cannot have slaves. We will never have slavery in Georgia. Guys, that lasted for a whopping five years. James Oglethorpe dies of disease on one of his many adventures into the backcountry of Georgia. And very quickly, the local legislature takes over and they rewrite the charter of the colony so that they can participate in this lucrative trade in humans. Here's the thing, guys. Um, the money was there. That's where the money was. OK, and I can guarantee you at some point in your life, you can you will be tempted to give up your values in exchange for cash. The question is, what are you going to do at that point? And it's really easy to say, oh, I'll keep my values. See me in 10 years and tell me how successful you were at that. We'll see. The proof is really going to be in the pudding. We'll see. OK, so there's all group of people we haven't been talking about here. Well, there's a couple of them. First, I want to briefly remind you that the French are also in North America, and they actually control more land than the English do. Look like at all of this area. It's huge. This is called what, what some historians refer to, and I kind of like this, as the Crescent Empire. You can kind of see that crescent shape that it looks kind of like a croissant right here. OK, it's really based around the Great Lakes. And there's a river. Well, it's actually called the St. Lawrence Seaway that runs from the Atlantic directly into the Great Lakes. And the French were the first to explore that. And they start to establish cities like Ottawa and Quebec and others. But there were never really a lot of French people in North America. So they chose to ally with Native Americans. And that was a huge bonus to them because Native Americans knew the land. They knew how to survive here. They knew what was over the next ridge. And that's what allows the French to claim all of this territory, what we call Louisiana, as theirs. Notice this takes all of the Mississippi Valley, the Missouri, the Ohio, all of the major river systems of America are really within this French empire. Now, again, they don't really control it. They share it with Native Americans. And that's going to be a problem a little bit later on that we'll come to in just a little bit. OK. So we've kind of danced around this topic of Native Americans, and we're seeing how different colonies are, are really responding to the Indian problem, as the English called it. So uh, uh, Pennsylvania, for example, chose to pay these people for the land that was taken from them, at least until William Penn died. Uh, uh, Jamestown chose to go to war with them. Well, that's going to become the standard response from the English colonies. And in the, eight, in the 17th and 18th centuries, we're going to see a series of wars between the English settlers and the Native Americans. And there's tons of them. I just want to mention a couple of them. Uh, there's lots of them, and we don't have time to, to really cover all of them. But uh, one of the first major ones was in 1637. This is called the Pequot War. Oops. Uh, the Pequot were 
a Native American tribe that was almost exterminated when they went to war with the uh, with the Connecticut colony. That's that's one we didn't really have time to cover that much of. It's not really that interesting of an early history. But most of their land is going to be taken during this Pequot War when they literally almost exterminate the entire tribe, wipe them out almost to every single man and woman. The next major one is what's called King Philip's War. Although uh, this is really, I, I, I struggle with this because this guy's real name was Metacom. That's, that's his name. But for some reason, that wasn't, you know, the English colonists didn't want to pronounce that. So they just called him King Philip. That's not his name. I have no idea where that came from. It's just they decided to call him Philip. It's like if I called K, Bob. Hey, Bob, good to see you today. You're not Bob, and that's disrespectful, okay? And it shows how little I care about you as a human being when I can't even call you by the name you prefer, okay? Sorry, Kay, I'll always call you Kay. Um, so here, let's call a man Medicom, okay? Medicom, in 1675, tried to unite the tribes against European encroachment on his land. This conflict was incredibly bloody, and it leads to the parliament in England once again renewing this discussion of what they call the Indian problem. Well, the problem is you're stealing their land and they're pissed about it and they're fighting back, okay? Maybe you could solve that by not stealing their land, but clearly that's a very modern perspective, okay? Um, you got to keep in mind, it's easy to criticize the colonists for doing this, but every civilization in history has done this. We celebrate Julius Caesar for going out and conquering Gaul and England, and that's all big. There were people living there, indigenous tribes that he killed. How is that different than Sundiata or any other great conqueror from anywhere in the world? So take care. If we're going to praise the people of the ancient past for doing that, why do we criticize the people from the recent past for doing the exact same thing? Thing. I don't know. Probably because our values change over time. But let that be a, a different story. Uh, King William's war lasted from 1689 to 1697. That's an eight year long war, which included a major uprising in the desert southwest here among the Pueblo Indians around what will become Santa Fe. This was a long-term uprising against the Spanish uh, and their actions against Native Americans as well. So how are Native Americans going to deal with this? They are going to try to unite. And they create what, I, what is called the League of the Iroquois. Now, this had been established as early as 1570, but it was a very, very loose confederation, really until they faced the outside pressure from Native Americans. Now, notice some of this land, this is what will become, all of this is what will become Pennsylvania. So at first, this isn't really a problem. But once William Penn dies and his sons take over, then more and more whites are coming into this land. What the Iroquois did, they were a confederation of five tribes, and each tribe sent 50 representatives. They elected among themselves the 50 best and brightest to go to a central location and to negotiate everything. This is actually the first legislative body in the new world. This was established before any European even arrived here, a hundred years before they did almost. And so in many ways, we end up copying the Native American style of leadership when we create our constitution. We certainly borrowed very heavily from this. So they would discuss issues of war and law and trade, of treaties. They established boundaries for the tribes. Again, that lie that Native Americans didn't own land is exactly that. It's just a lie. But, uh... And there's Robert. Okay, just want to make sure I got everybody on the roll. So this confederation began to break down, uh, especially once the demand for trade, and especially the trade in furs. 
You probably heard this. The French especially wanted to trade in furs, and beaver pelts became incredibly popular in the 16th and 17th century. They're very dense. They're very thick. They're, they make for a great coat if you're okay with wearing dead animal fur, uh, you know, to each their own, but gross in my opinion. Um, and this led to a series of wars between the different tribes for control of these hunting grounds. They're, they're called the Beaver Wars, and these were carried out in the 1640s. So these are happening very early after the first English and French colonies are being established. The League of Iroquois continues, but in a weakened form. And Benjamin Franklin actually is the one who will study the League of the Iroquois. And he tries to create uh, uh, eventually a Europe, or, or, well, I guess not a European, but an an American version of this. He calls it the New England Confederation, but we'll talk about that for another day. Okay, so before I let you go, I, I wanna talk about just a couple more things here. I wanna talk about our kind of, our, our per perceptions of how we picture the colonies. Now, if you've ever been to Jamestown or any of these early colonies, you, you probably have this picture in your head of women wearing these white bonnets and big black skirts. The guys have those funky hats that for some reason have a belt buckle on the front. I guess you need a spare belt buckle. I have no idea. But fashion kind of you know leaves me behind. I'm a t-shirt and jeans kind of guy. Uh, and you know, to each their own, you do you, boo-boo. Uh, but you know, fashion just ain't my thing. So we tend to think of these as very kind of polite English places where men bow to women and take off their hats and everything's polite. Yeah, maybe it's a little dirty and you got to poop outside, but everybody's polite. It could not be any further from the truth. These early colonies are chaotic. They're violent places. People die mysteriously. There are Native American attacks and there are attacks from the colonists themselves. This is one of the most important stories in early American history, and this is the story of Nathaniel Bacon. In, whoops, let's see if I can get my, there we go, 1675. In 1675, Nathaniel Bacon was a large landholder in Virginia. He lived just outside of Jamestown in some of the land that they had expanded out into that they had to fight for. Well, Native Americans didn't like that white settlers kept stealing their land. So in 1675, a band of Native Americans attacked uh, uh, Nathaniel Bacon's land, and they ended up killing his overseer. We'll talk a lot more about slavery later on, but the overseer is the person who is in charge of the plantation, of the 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 land. And Nathaniel Bacon is what many slave owners was. He's an absentee landlord. He doesn't want to live on the plantation. He wants to live in the city of Jamestown. He's rich. He wants to live where the rich people live. Okay. And most of them don't live out in the country. They live in the city. Okay. <clears throat> when he finds out that his overseer was killed by Indians, he is furious. And he goes to the royal governor and he demands that the royal governor turn over the military to him, give him personal control of the the uh, of the native of the. Uh, I'm sorry, I lost my track of the military. Well, okay, the governor refuses. And so uh, that's not going to stop our friend Nathaniel Bacon. Instead, what he does is he goes to the local store and he buys as much liquor as he can find. And he starts preaching kind of in the middle of the streets of Jamestown. And he's handing out all this free liquor. There's actually a, a, a South Park episode that kind of covers this. Uh, if you've ever seen the S'more Snobs episode, it's almost exactly like that. OK, so now James, uh, uh, excuse me, um, uh, uh, Nathaniel Bacon, he's got a, a crowd of drunken men. He gets them all hyped and pissed off, and he says, okay, guys, let's go kill us some Indians. And they do exactly that. They go out and they start massacring Native Americans. The problem is they don't care which ones. They actually end up killing different members of a different tribe, not even the same tribe that attacked uh, Nathaniel Bacon's land and killed his overseer, they killed entirely different Native Americans, but they didn't care. 
And then after they ran out of Native Americans they could find, they marched back on Jamestown and they burned it to the ground. So this is why I said before, if you've been to Jamestown, the one you're looking at ain't the original, okay? That got burned down to the ground, not by a Native American, but by an American, by a colonist, by Nathaniel Bacon and his drunken followers. Now, eventually he'll run out of alcohol. The, the, the city is burned down to the ground. The, the mob kind of burns itself out. The royal governor is going to be able to re-establish authority, and he hangs 23 rebels, and their bodies are left to rot in the streets of Jamestown as it's being rebuilt. Um, uh, our friend Nathaniel Bacon actually goes off into the woods, uh, and he dies of a disease, of a fever, and that kills him. But I, I put a, a link in, and you can look up what's called the Declaration of the People. And I would argue if you read this, it sounds like something Bernie Sanders would write today. OK, uh, uh, Nathaniel Bacon is claiming all power for the people. And it's almost kind of like something you would read out of, I don't know, Lenin or Marx. It's very radical in its tone. Uh, and so this idea that the colonies were this peaceful, calm place is just wrong. And probably the best example we see this is the Salem witch trials. Everybody's heard of this probably one of the most infamous moments in all of American history. In 1692, four teenage girls in Salem, Massachusetts, claimed that they had made deals with the devil. Uh, now, I, I, I don't mean to be offensive, but you know what? Seriously, hysterical teenage girls are a kind of dime a dozen, okay? I've got a 14-year-old daughter. She gets, you know, oh my God, you're doing it. And I'm just like, yes, dear. Yeah, you just kind of nod your head. And, yes, dear. That's 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 fantastic. And five minutes later, it's something entirely different. And, you know, I mean, God bless them. Uh, that being said, this is in the middle of the wars of religion in Europe. And the idea that there were witches and warlocks, that there was a war for your soul between God and the devil was very much alive, not just in Europe, but that's being imported into the Americas because most of the colonists had traveled from Europe and had lived there for at least part of their lives. This will result in a series of trials. And they're, see, they're overseen by a head judge. His name is Cotton Mather. Cotton Mather is probably the leading religious authority in the colonies at the time. He writes dozens of sermons and hymns, many of which are still used in, in Protestant churches to this day. Well, when he comes in, he makes a ruling that is very important at the beginning of the trial. He says that they will accept what he calls spectral evidence. That means that, um, okay, so... Let's say that I hear a voice in my head that says that, you know, Laura is is a witch. No offense, Laura. I'm just randomly picking you. I don't know. I don't care either. Right. Okay. So, you know, I, I heard that. I saw it. I, I heard it in a dream. I heard the voice in my head. Would that be applicable in court? If I went in a court of law and I said, I heard a voice that said that Laura's a witch. So we have to burn her. Well, today, of course, that wouldn't be applicable. But back then, Cotton Mather said that that was perfectly fine. And so because of that, more than 100 colonists will be jailed. Many of these people are people who had moved away. There's one preacher that had moved away 40 years before they went and found him and arrested him and brought him back and put him on trial. He hadn't been in the city of Salem for 40 years, but they still put him on trial. More than 100 men and women will be put into jail. Uh, uh, 20 of them will be sentenced to death and executed. Most of the women will be burned at the stake. Most of the men will be pressed to death. And this is where you put weight, put ever increasing uh, rocks, bigger and bigger rocks on the person's chest until they just simply can't breathe. And eventually the rocks will collapse their, their lungs and they die. And they're, they're crushed to death by the weight of the rocks. Nice stuff, huh? So this idea that the colonies were this peaceful, calm place where everybody was a gentleman or a lady, far from the truth. These are chaotic places. Sometimes England is asserting their authority. Other times they're just leaving these colonies to, to do as they see fit. 
this is going to lead eventually to a huge explosion of religious fervor. And this is where I want to leave off today, and we'll pick up on uh, on Wednesday. I want to talk about the Great Awakening. This is the first of a, a, a wave of religious revivals that are going to sweep across the colonies and are going to have long-lasting effects. And in fact, in many ways, we can trace the American Revolution directly back to the first Great Awakening. And that really begins in 1739. But that's where we'll pick up our story next time. Okay. Don't forget, if you did not get your homework in on Friday, get it in, okay? I cannot pass you if you don't do the work, okay? And and that's just it, okay? I would rather have you do mediocre work and get something in than have to just give you a zero, okay? I cannot give you a grade for free. I don't care what the high schools used to do. If you don't do the work, you fail, okay? That's college, and I can't change that. So get the work in if you haven't already. Uh, and then make sure you're preparing to get the work in uh, for Friday as well. You've got your next homework assignment due then. If you have any questions, let me know. Otherwise, uh, anybody got any questions for today? Okay. Well, then I'm going to let you go. I will see y'all on Wednesday. Thank you for coming. Hey, next time, be on time. Okay. A whole lot of you kind of staggered in 10, 15, 40 minutes late. Uh, if you're more than 20 minutes late, I don't count you as present. Okay. Uh, set an alarm, get your ass out of bed. It's called a job. Okay. Please. Yeah. This is your job. I love you guys. Be good. Be safe. I'll see y'all on Wednesday.